Hi everybody, welcome to The Art of Human. I am your host, Sapien. So I'm here to introduce you to episode 55 of the podcast. And during this podcast, I had the pleasure of speaking with Hassan Ismail. He is a returning guest to the podcast. He came on, it had to have been like a few months back. And I was really excited to have him back on because he's a very interesting and he's a very enlightened character with a lot of positive energy. But to give a little more detail as to who Hassan is, he's somebody who I serendipitously met through Instagram and he is somebody who is very focused and determined with regard to his own spirituality and he's just very passionate about spirituality and that's kind of something that really, really just is important to know about him. Um, Hassan is also a musician. Hassan is a podcaster. Hassan plays many different roles. He's a very eclectic person when it comes to his lifestyle. He doesn't put limitations. He likes to see things from a universal eye. And without giving out too much, that's pretty much the way I would describe him. And during this podcast, what we really emphasize on is his newest creative endeavor, which is a book that he's in the process of publishing. And we talk about the book during the podcast. That's the main focus. And I kind of edited the podcast a little bit just to keep uh, things more contextual to the book. But of course, me being the person that I am and him being a very uh, kind of similar character in the sense that he likes to focus on the macro perspective of things and ideas and philosophy, we definitely kind of dove into particular ideas. For instance, we definitely talk about the story of Adam and Eve for a, for a decent amount of time as that's relevant to Hassan's book. We also talk about the importance of innocence and how innocence is actually something very powerful and balancing that with being a responsible person is uh, very important and that's also relevant to his book. And then the last topic, which I know is a pretty big discussion, is the idea of how art and religion do coincide according to Hassan and his philosophy. And so we also talk about creativity and well, that's kind of giving you guys a little bit of an outline for what you can expect. But I wouldn't expect anything because I think expectations kind of, they they kind of taint the experience of just about anything. So I just wouldn't expect anything. Uh, that's just all I got to say. But big hug for all you guys. I'd give you a big hit kiss on the forehead if I was with you. I might be kind of shy to do it, to be honest. But if I was invisible, I'd give everybody a kiss on the forehead. But for sure a hug. For sure a hug. All right, guys. Hope you enjoy. Bye. Oh, and last thing I didn't mention was that the book that Hassan is working on is called The Riddle of Life. And if you'd like to get in contact with Hassan to talk with him, to know more about his book or when it's going to be published, etc., etc. If you want to keep up with his content, you know, I said he does music, he does podcasting, he's writing this book. He's got a lot of awesome stuff. So if you want to get into contact with him, I'm going to make sure to put his contact info in the description of the podcast. So go ahead, look at the description if you want to get in contact with Hassan. And that is it. Now I hope you enjoy. <laughs> I just press record because I don't really yeah. care to be like, hey, yo, like we're about to start. Like, get ready. <laughs> like, I'm just like, we'll just start and just kind of, yeah. we're just talking. You know what I'm saying? Ultimately, that's all it is. We're just talking. Yeah. So. True. Yeah. yeah, man, but just uh, I know you want to talk about this book. I know you yeah. talked about you started writing a book. The last yeah. time we had the podcast, you had talked about it. So it's yeah. been a few months since the last podcast. Like, have yeah. you been writing a lot lately or like yeah. where are you in the process for the book? So uh, mainly now I'm almost done. A little bit of uh, touches here and there and the book will be done. And uh, I'll be... Um, uh, representing the book for an editor to review it and uh, that the book will be almost done uh, hopefully in less than a month I'll be publishing the book if anybody wants to follow up with me just uh, link them my Instagram or uh, my YouTube channel on the, on the uh, yeah I'll put in the description of the episode and they yeah. can follow up in case they want to read the book is called actually the riddle of life it's uh, more like uh, thoughts. So I present my thoughts. It's written, it's not in, written in, uh, in type of paragraphs. It's written like 
thoughts. You know, when you write a sentence, then you go write another, but like poems. Mm-hmm. But it's not fully poetic. There is poetry, but it's not fully poetic. So there is, uh, mo- it's more of thoughts, you know, when you're sitting and you just write your own thoughts. So the, the, every, every thought is relevant to the second thought, but it's, it's not written in, in a paragraph, you know? Okay, I got you. In a way, you can read one sentence and you can uh, start learning many things from just one sentence. You don't have to read, you don't have to follow up to understand, you know? You okay. can, like, while you're sitting, you just uh, pick up one sentence and every sentence actually is meaningful. Mm-hmm. Also, if you read the whole uh, page, it gives you the bigger picture of what I'm talking about. I don't okay. know if you um, got what I'm uh, talking about exactly. It, it's, not, it's not a usual type of um, uh, a form of writing. It's not very usual, but I, I like it, actually. I, do, uh, I was enjoying writing that book. Have you, have you read other books that are the style that, you're, that you chose to do it in? Yeah, uh, so I'm basically, I'm not sure if you've heard of uh, Gibran Khalil Gibran. No. So Gibran Khalil Gibran is um, an American-Lebanese po- uh, poet and author. And uh, he writes a, a lot of spiritual, have you heard of the book, The Prophet? No, I haven't. Oh man, you, you need to read that book. You the Prophet? Read, yeah, The Prophet by Gibran Khalil Gibran. So you'll have that, to you'll have to message me that because I don't know how to type yeah. that name that you said. Yeah, I'll message you that. I'll message you the uh, book and um, the style of writing is in a way similar to Gibran's way because I, I was very influenced by Gibran Khalil Gibran. Was one of my biggest influences in writing actually, and I've read almost uh, all of his books and I'm. I'm very uh, big fan of him. He, he's he's dead by now, <laughs> but uh, I, I till now um, read his uh, words because they are very very uh, powerful, and they give you a lot of inspiration and hope in life. Got you. Okay, so all right, we got that description. You've been inspired by this author, about the prophet, and he's yeah. a very spiritual gentleman. And obviously, that's kind of the way that you describe yourself if you go on your instagram i think you have on there what do you what's your thing it says like spiritual speaker or something like that yeah spiritual uh spirituality uh symbolism we talk about uh, symbolism spirituality ancient history yeah and then you've told us that in your book it's very unconventional in the sense that it's not like just a full page of writing it's one thought and then you go to the next thought and every sentence can be read by itself and you could learn just from individual sentences but then yeah. if you finish the entire page collectively it's it's an even more powerful message or it's exactly. more cohesive yes you understand the, the whole picture so one okay. sentence you can understand something in your life you can understand something about the riddle of life but the whole page will make the riddle more uh, clear but at the end it's a riddle you need to always try to read, read it again. You know, the wise words are not too many, but they are very powerful. So you don't have, I, I, that's why I didn't, uh, I didn't want to write a whole huge paragraph on every page because the, the powerful words are not too many. And uh, you can, um, like sometimes one, two, three, four words, and you can understand a lot of information out of just four words, you know? Yeah. It's just the way you put them together. Okay, how many how many chapters and how many pages, and like you know, like can you tell us more about that, like chapters or how the book is like actually? Yeah, the book actually like the book actually is not it's not so long. It's uh, the whole book is about 120 pages, so you can finish it in one day. So imagine 120 pages, and every page is written in in, uh, in a sentence form. So you just read a sentence, second sentence. So it's not like uh, the whole page is full of words, you know? And um, yeah, you can finish it in one day. I, I've been reading it like, I finish it almost like every day sometimes. I, I, when I'm <laughs> bored, I just like to uh, read it because sometimes you write your own words and you get influenced by your own self, oh, yeah. you know? And it's about six, like it's 16 chapters. And uh, the main, 
genre of the book, if you might say, it's more uh, philosophical and spiritual at the same time. So it's like a spiritual and philosophical journey. So there's a lot of philosophical ideas in that book. I mentioned Descartes, I mentioned some other, uh, but in a poetic way. So it's like spirituality, philosophy, and poetry, you know, mixed yeah. together, fusing, fused together in one uh, piece of book. And uh, there is religion too, and art. I've spoken in the book about religion, about art, but not in a religious way, in a more in a universal eye type of way, you know? Okay. So I discussed the concept of religion. I didn't speak about a religion. I discussed, discussed why there is a religion, why we have a religion, why we need a religion, why we need rituals in our life. This type of uh, concept, these type of questions were asked in the book. And um, I also discussed historical um, stories, prehistorical story, like the story of Adam and Eve in the first chapter of the book. So I started the book with uh, actually the starting story of humanity in the, the religious books. Uh, the story of Adam and Eve, for example. I've spoken about that story, but in a very symbolic way. I didn't say in that book um, how the Bible or uh, the Quran or the Torah or uh, whatever prehistoric religion spoke about this story. I didn't address Adam and Eve as a personal um, entity. No, Adam and Eve is a story for every human being. Every human being represents Adam and Eve. Every human being represents this loop, that, the endless loop of being created, evolving, dying. And the story of Adam and Eve actually is a transitional story from a way, a certain way of life to a more advanced way of life. Like for example, uh, I don't wanna spoil the book, but I'll give a small um, uh, idea that I discussed in the book where I've spoken about when Adam and Eve ate that apple. So basically they were living a certain way of life before transitioning into eating that apple. So the way of life that they were experiencing, they were, uh, the, the religious books tell us they were naked. They didn't have anything on them. So when they ate that apple, they actually put something on them. Leaves, like the leaves, they started covering their bodies. So this rings a bell for me of uh, the transition from the tribal way of life into the more advanced civilized way of life. So Adam and Eve transitioned from uh, the tribes, the uh, people who wander on earth, they don't have a certain place to settle. And once they ate that apple, they transitioned into the civilization. Mm. I don't know if this rings a bell for you, but it does make sense to me a lot that this, trend, this apple was a representation of going into the uh, transition off to the civilized state, civilized way of life. And um, the sins, as you know, the apple represents the sins. Those sins actually are the sins of a civilization. Before that apple, in the tribal way of life, they don't have sins. You can do whatever you want to do, you know? Mm -hmm. You can go, uh, you can uh, steal, you can kill, you can eat your brother, you can do whatever you want to do. But that apple is a representation of uh, having consciousness of the sin. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I cannot kill my brother anymore to eat my brother. I cannot um, have sexual relation with any type of human like animals do. So we transitioned to the second phase, which is civilized. And then we went into this uh, phase of the sins where Everything now we're conscious about, oh, we can do that. We cannot do that. This is good. This is bad. This is, and you know what I'm, we also discussed a little bit in the previous podcast about the good and the bad. Yeah, yeah. It lies also, it's connected to the ideas we discussed before. And um, this whole transition created our life today. The life we're living today 
is based upon the story of Adam and Eve. But if you want to take it in a very literal way, you lose the essence of that story. You'll be like, okay, two people, Adam and Eve, they are the source of all humans on earth. But that's not, the, that's not what the story actually wants you to know. Mm -hmm. The story wants you to know much, much more things than just, oh, Adam and Eve are the, the, uh, your, your original father and mother, you know? Yeah, because I feel like sometimes, like I feel like all these stories, like you said, they're, they're, they're there to kind of empower you to see how that story is relative to your life and how that little narrative is actually a truth that exists within the world that we live in and it's yeah. more so an example of something more than like a literal thing you know what i'm saying yeah. i mean you could take it literal i don't know if it's like if that legitimately happened there was two people called that and like that exactly happened yeah. but i'm like that i'm i'm like i'll i'll read the story and be like oh it's so like i'll take away the message and then that can empower me because yeah. i mean wh for me it's like what kind of benefit is it going to give me if i'm just always thinking about those two people and like how they ate the apple you know yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah like, um, there, there's no literal way oh how they did eat it and why did they eat it no no the story actually yeah. it doesn't make sense to me that humanity all, only started with two people you know there's mm -hmm. a, a plenty of tribes spread on earth you know yeah but the adam and eve story is the story of every human being you me uh, your your parents when once they enter into the phase of good and evil they ate that apple once you are born and you get uh, your your parents actually teach you and implement in your mindset the the uh, the act of good and evil you ate that apple once that voice inside your head the language voice starts speaking in your head you at that moment eat that apple and that story repeats and repeats and repeats with all of human beings on earth but you're saying that this narrative of adam and eve is only applicable after we've become civilized so when we were tribal that yeah. wasn't a reality yet i didn't say that the tribe didn't have morals the animals have morals you know that the animals, in a certain way, have their own morals because they respect the laws of nature. And that is one of the biggest morals a being can uh, be um, acting to, to respect the laws of nature. If the apple and Adam and Eve, let me, let me be accurate now. The, that moment is when the apple was eaten is a phase when the human disrespected the laws of nature. Mm. so basically the human didn't even know how to build a tent or build somewhere a shelter shelter to sit inside and shelter, shelter themselves the apple actually is the transition into the phase where we disrespected the laws of nature so when adam and eve went into that phase they started trying to conquer over nature instead of nature being the conqueror. That, the tribes today are conquered by uh, nature. They respect the laws of nature. They have morals. In both ways, also civilized people have morals. But that, the, the, the key is not, that, not the morals. The key actually is the word civilized. So why do you consider yourself civilized why do i consider myself civilized is it because i wear a certain way i speak a certain way i act a certain way you know mm -hmm. so this is a very powerful philosophical question or am i um civilized because a, a certain way of thinking uh, are the tribes civilized can i consider them civilized because uh, if I change the, the mindset I have, I can look at a tribal person as being civilized if they do uh, a certain type of uh, acts. I can make them civilized. So the key is not the morals. Everybody has morals. Even animals have morals. The key actually is uh, nature. 
the, the, the way we disrespected nature is the representation of that apple. So would you say examples of humans today disrespecting nature would be um, maybe like creating material, like let's say plastic that could not be like put back into the planet and yep. maybe like us putting particular gases up in the sky and maybe us um, like affecting the soil and then not refertilizing the soil to then go back to its natural state. Is it kind of like all this artificial stuff, like this stuff that we've influenced by mankind, but in a way that changes the earth and changes nature for a prolonged period of time? Yeah. Because I mean, ultimately nature will always conquer in some shape or form, right? Or yeah, what do you no, think? We, How do you feel about that? We are trying, humans today, are reaching the highest levels of that apple, actually. The highest level of that sin. That, that exact sin was conquering over nature. And that sin, actually, uh, driving a car, uh, doing the process of combustion, is killing nature. This is conquering nature. This is going beyond nature using your air conditioner to control the weather inside of your uh, temperature, inside of your uh, place, is a way of conquering over nature. Um, cutting trees to uh, build and uh, to uh, use uh, like for a, a huge type of lands, you know, they cut a lot of trees, they almost kill nature just for their ego. Uh, killing animals uh, to a point where they are uh, extinct is also a way of destroying the balance in nature. Uh, trying to go to space, uh, blowing all this uh, toxic uh, smokes in the air, all of those are forms of uh, conquering or disrespecting Mother Nature. And uh, trying to conquer it and say to the world that, look, we can live in the most comfortable way we can do without uh, animals eating us or weather or nature destroying us. Yeah, I guess my comment regarding that, because I do think that in certain aspects, it is like humans kind of conquering nature and things of that sort. But at the same time, I also think to myself, like, some of this, well, I think a lot of it, if not everything, like, it's about the intent of the person who, who did the thing. So, like, someone may be driving a car to work, and they're conquering nature in the sense that they're putting gases in the air that's affecting the nature. But at the same time, maybe this person's ignorant to the fact that they're even doing that or the science behind it, and they're just living, like, an ordinary life being a happy good person or let's say for instance maybe we design a car like you know there's like a formula one and like certain cars like that and there's a lot of like art and beauty and creativity and inspiration that is also co that coincides with these kind of you know us conquering if that makes sense do you get what i'm trying to say yeah a little bit yeah like, like what I'm trying to get at is that like, yes, we're conquering nature, but at the same time, there's a lot of creativity and beauty okay. that comes from this, especially oh, okay. when the, the intent is something yeah. good. Yeah. So it's like, is it still yeah, a yeah. sin or like, no. I don't know. No, no, no. Uh, art, art, creativity, art is not conquering over nature. Nat art is in nature. Art already, you look outside, you see those beautiful mountains, beautiful sunsets, beautiful clouds. Art is in nature. I spoke in the book also, so you are, you're not predicting what the book is actually going to tell you more. The book actually talks about art too. It represents what is art. And uh, it presents the relation between art and morals, art and religion. Because in religion, there is art. In, in every sense, we are humans creative. In everything we do, we add a creative touch to it. It's not creativity follows us. Tribes have their own art. Uh, the act of creativity is not 
conquering nature. It does not have to do anything with, con with conquering nature. Uh, the act of destruction, the act, the act of destroying nature for our ego is actually destroying nature. You know, the, uh, when, when you want to create something for only the benefit of yourself, and that also results in um, destroying nature. Art does not do that. Art is the total opposite. Art you're giving people more than you're getting. Any artist knows they have drawn many drawings. They have played many, many pieces of music. They have uh, written many books. They have done many things more than actually they, have, they are giving back. So artists, art actually gives more than it takes. Okay. It's a, a total opposite. So a God, for example, the creator is the a giver because he uses this aspect of creativity. The aspect of creativity is a, a, a giving in abundance, you know? And... Um, I, I think this answers your question by now. The, the act of being, an, uh, the act of creativity is uh, in itself, you're saying creativity creates. It creates, it doesn't destroy. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's just very, it's just very interesting because uh, the kind of mindset that I have nowadays, and I guess I'm just saying this for conversation, but um, it's like nothing's like inherently bad or good. You know, when you really just kind of see things objectively and, you know, you can have that voice in the back of your head that's trying to judge it and analyze it, whether it's good or bad, like the morals that we're talking about. Yeah. But when you just kind of let those thoughts just kind of run their course and, and you don't take them personally and you don't label them as this is a good thought and this is a bad thought. And when you really just kind of objectively view things and you embrace them for what they are and the feelings that you get from doing them or watching them, like... And I'm starting to say this word now because of the last conversation that we had, like the word beauty, you know, yeah. like I remember you using that word a lot and I really enjoy that. And it really resonated with me because that's kind of the way I see things is like, there's always a beauty in everything. I remember yeah. last time you said after war, there is beauty, you know, after destruction and after all that, there's something that rises from that. Yeah, so exactly. With that kind of macro perspective mindset, I feel like it's like, sure, like humans, maybe conquering nature but ultimately like in the big big picture yeah like it's not necessarily bad that a human's even conquering it at least from my perspective because like it's just the nature of the the way it all is you know what i'm saying yes so basically when uh someone wants to build something uh, they also put their creativity in, even if they are conquering over nature. Like the car, for example, there's beautiful cars. There is beauty in the car. There's beauty, in, uh, there's a touch of beauty in, in everything that is part of our nature. We, we project, but at the same time, we're projecting that flaw inside of us. True, yeah. There's a, a flaw that we are saying that we are over everything. We're over the mountains, we're over the, the world. But the thing is, we are flawed beings. We have a lot of flaws moving inside of us. We hate, we love. So we don't only love. There is flaw. There is this hate thing. We envy. We uh, talk bad things about other people in their back. So there's a lot of things we need to practice so that this, those flaws become less. There's no one that cannot do something bad. All humans do something bad. Respecting religions, they say, okay, prophets, they are sinless, they don't do sins, let's do them as an exception. But as of us human, average humans, we do, we are learning, we are in the learning process. So we, we, we are not like uh, <laughs> sent from God <laughs> directly. We are here to learn from our bad acts. You know, without the bat, you cannot learn uh, anything. So we need this process of doing something bad to learn. Conquering nature is something that has something good and something bad. You know, 
Yeah, and it, and it just like just to go on that, like you said, there needs to be the bad for the good. It's funny mm-hmm. because while there is companies, organizations, and people who are cutting down trees and 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 affecting the soil from its natural state, and we're conquering nature. At the same time, you have people who are who are who have campaigns and who have companies that are bettering the environment, who are planting new plants, who are refertilizing the soil, who are finding new ways to be more efficient with our resources and finding ways to use natural energy and use it in a very natural way so that we're not actually wasting the planet. So it's just kind of funny because as we're conquering nature, we also give back to nature through all our innovative and loving and creative like things that we do. Yes. So it's kind of awesome because it's always it's always that constant cycle. Yes, there is people who are trying to plant, who are trying to help uh, Mother Nature to grow instead of die. They are not as too many as the other part of the people who are uh, trying to destroy, trying to put that word down. There is people who are trying to do electric cars to save uh, environment. There, there are people who are doing solar uh, energy power to, um, it's much better than using um, the yes. uh, other sources of power. So, you know what I mean? There's yeah. people who are working to better the means of the civilization, to better the acts of, but there's people who don't want us to go into that phase. Civilizations grow and fall, grow and fall. There's not one single civilization in the whole in the whole history of planet Earth that stayed on the top. Even the civilizations that followed followed the Mother Nature's laws. In a way, they failed. But the one people that are watching are the tribes, because civilizations grow and fall, grow and fall. But the tribes are still watching. Where are we going to? what what are we doing why we are repeating that same story of a civilization of adam and eve we are just eating that apple again going into the phase of a civilization then boom the flood so the people you're saying the tribes again are you like so are you saying that tribal people they don't fall and go down like that no. doesn't happen within tribes no 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 tribes they live their own way they live their own life following the laws of nature following the laws of nature the tribe in itself stays a tribe and the families just die yeah they there's tribes that kill one another there's tribes that fight you know but they don't destroy the uh maturity on a huge level okay well let's go back to the book because i am like if people are listening and people are interested in the book like what kind of people do you think would have interest in the book and for who would it benefit like that's my question like who would the book benefit like younger people older people like people who are just searching to find purpose in their life like what kind of people would benefit from that anyone that reads the book from any age can get benefits even from reading one sentence any seeker of truth seeker of knowledge seeker of wisdom will benefit from that book any uh curious person any person who's uh, seeking inspiration, who's seeking answers for the riddle called life, because that's the, the title, the riddle of life. Um, those type of people, whatever the age is, some people are 10 years old and they are wiser than the 20s and the 30 years old. And I do believe uh, young kids have a lot of wisdom and I spoke about it in the book actually in one of the chapters where I speak about innocence and how innocence plays a huge role in making you a genius but this is something that 
not all people accept because, oh, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm whatever, I don't want to be, uh, I don't have, I don't want to be innocent anymore, I want to, but the thing is, if you, if you just learn the wisdom of innocence, the wisdom hidden, decoded in innocence, it will lead you to many answers. You ask me why, what, what, does, ha what, what, have what does have innocence to do with G being a genius because if uh, if you look at something from an innocent point of view when you say innocent means pure means you are looking at something purely without any external and internal uh, agents affecting you you're, you're looking at it purely from a spiritual sense when i say spiritual the word spiritual is connecting yourself with the universal law with with god with those aspects so when you're looking at something from a very pure way you get to learn the details of how it's made why it's made how can you better it how can you add to it how can you alchemize it you decompose it with your innocent eye. Same as a baby uh, or a kid, small kid can see something sometimes that uh, look at something and can they can comment something that even old people didn't see. But why that young kid was able to see it? Because he wasn't yet infiltrated by external agents like uh, confidence, for example. Confidence. A lot of people today don't have the confidence to prove themselves in society because they lost innocence. If they have still, if they are, if they have innocence inside of them, innocence allows you to prove yourself innocently like a kid. A kid, why, they, why kids are, are confident? They, you know, they, they have this energy, they want to play, they want to destroy, they want to uh, do many things out there. Why? Because of that aspect of innocence inside of them, because they don't care. They don't care what other people will say about them. They have innocence. They are innocent people. They're just expressing themselves. You know, mm -hmm. if, if, all, if, if a kid uh, creates something that doesn't make sense to me because I'm old, but that something might be a genius idea in the future. But today we're saying, oh, he's just a kid. So he's speaking nonsense because he's a kid. But no. The innocence, the eye of innocence plays a huge role for the, to be a genius. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. And it's interesting. Uh, that's a good point that I would love to talk about because I feel like that innocence, or in other words, just doing whatever you want and not caring about whatever the people think. And like yeah. you said, like not having your mind, having it been infiltrated or having all these pessimistic thoughts that would lower your self-esteem to never do the thing that you really want to do because you're so fearful of judgment. I feel like in a way that's, that's kind of what everybody kind of wants to feel, you know, like yeah. everybody wants to feel innocent. Everybody wants to do whatever the hell they want, but it's all those like influences that you usually get as you get older that leave you not being innocent not being that innocent kid that you once were yeah because the world you live in destroys this word innocence by thinking that it's actually uh, foolishness but there's a huge difference between being innocent and being a fool so they're being like no i don't want to be innocent I want to be a man or a woman or innocence makes you uh, look weak, like a right? fool. Like you're weak or something too, right? Yeah, like, like everybody can uh, control you and everybody can tell you uh, and you're just innocent, you don't understand anything. No, no. We're not, we do not want to be that person that doesn't know anything and everybody's lying to because we'll end up with a, a very messed up, destroyed life. We need to be a man, be a woman, but 
don't lose the, the act of innocence because of thinking it's foolishness. It's not foolishness. Innocence, it's a very, very pure eye that we can use to learn more and create more. Yeah. How do you, how do you personally feel regarding your innocence? Like, do you feel yeah. like you're still innocent? Or, like, uh, how do you feel like from a kid, like when you were a kid yeah. and like today and like throughout your life, have you felt like you've retained your innocence or how do you feel well, about that? Yeah, th there's a famous quote, quote about a person that says, um, do not lose, uh, do not become a man. Oh no, do not grow. It's a trap. In other way, in other words, he's saying, stay a kid, do not grow. Because growing up is a trap. Basically, being a man does not mean you have to lose being a kid. You need to have that kid inside of you. Nobody loses that kid. They are lying to themselves. They are acting because we're actors, you know? Oh, I want to act. Oh, I'm a man. I want to act like a man now, you know? But they deep inside have that kid, even though if they lie to themselves and say, no, I'm no longer a kid. You have that kid inside of you. I have that kid inside of me. It depends as much how much you want to express that child inside of you. Some people want to abandon it and put it in a grave and no longer show, show it to the people. Some people want not to be men or women. They want to keep that child expressive in them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. As of me personally, I believe I'm trying to build a balance between uh, the, uh, the act of a man and the act of a child. I don't want to lose my child inside of me, the child inside of me. And I don't want to lose the man inside of me because being a man has benefits and being a child has also benefits. So you tell me what benefits me of being a child? Innocence, that I of a genius that enables you to look at things and learn more and decode more, you know? The genius, actually, I believe, uses innocence, any genius, Isaac Newton, Einstein, whatever you want to, uh, whatever genius you want to say, they use innocence in their work to learn more, to be able to reach this type of theory they theorize about. And uh, the benefit from the man? Like, because you said you want that being balance of man, time. Exactly. Being a man gives you responsibilities to be responsible to act in life, act in society, uh, to be responsible to um, take responsibility over your family, take responsibility over your uh, shelter, your, your place, your community. This helps uh, me in being the man. Okay, I got you. So, yeah. yeah, and it's kind of funny because it seems as if when you're a child, you have a lot, a lot of innocence. But as a child, your brain's not fully developed either. And there's particular yeah. parts of your brain that are developing and yeah. aren't really fully developed until <laughs> you're 25. So it's yeah. like, it's almost like as a kid, you, you're 100% innocent because like by, de <laughs> by default, your brain doesn't even have the ability to be a man, you know? Yeah. But once you become older, I think the idea is to, to maintain that proper balance, right? To exactly. still, to not lose that kid, but still, you could obviously still be a man or be a responsible adult because you've yes. learned these different morals or rules that that help maintain that equilibrium that balance it gives you that structure that stability yeah. to have a home to have a family and all these different things and i feel like that kind of goes to because i mean as humans obviously we're so complex so sophisticated yeah you know, there's the idea 
I feel like there's like the truth in like opposites, you know, stability, but also relaxed or like, you know, like being solid, but then also relaxed yeah. being, you know, being able to go fast, but also being able to go slow. Like it's there's so always like that, that contrast, which is super awesome. And it really gets me excited because I feel like ultimately it's always about finding your balance. Yeah. Like I can't tell you what you need. It's about what do you need to kind of balance things out for you? Cause your biology, your life experience, you know, all these different variables. Decode goes, who you are. Huh? They decode who you are. Yeah, exactly. Like you might need way more of one thing that I need. Maybe exactly. you only, maybe you only need your to sleep like six does hours. Not work, does not work on my way. And my way does not work on your way. You know? Exactly. Yeah, that's why the, the book, the Dao. I, I think you call your podcast Dao. Uh, it's called The Art of Human, but it just so happens to be T-A-O-H. T-A-O, K-A-O, actually, Dao. And I'm, I'm not sure it means the way. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, the Lao Tzu actually wrote that book, um, The Dao De Ching. The way, actually. You have your way. I have my way. I cannot force my way onto your way. I cannot tell you the rules of success. You know, you have your own rules of success that are more uh, compatible with your program of the program of your biology, uh, mentality, uh, thoughts, mind, everything. I have my own way of success of uh, doing what I, what I need to do, you know? Yeah, I totally get it. Hey, do you, is there any particular like things that you want to continue to highlight about the book? Cause I like, I want to talk about the book is like, if there's particular things that you yeah. want to say or like any particular thing, cause I want to give you the opportunity to yeah, be sure. able to talk about that. Sure. So basically I also wrote in the book, um, about, um, uh, the art in general, as I said, uh, we, I mentioned, um, what is related between art and spirituality what's the relation between art and spirituality and religion and all that so basically art plays a huge role in anything we do actually in anything it's not like oh if you work in let's say uh technology or mathematics or physics it means you're not an artist you are an artist because you are trying to uh, be artistical in the way you form your own equations the art of numbers there's an art for it how to de how to compose an equation how to be the, the art of thinking in that manner of equations so the art is in everything so in the book also i mentioned the relation between art and religion so some say religion hates art no it's the total opposite actually religion needs art and you ask me why you're saying that because look from any type of religion ancient modern prehistoric all of those religions have art inside of them like ancient egypt for example the sculptures the sculptures they built it's a form of art the uh the paintings on the walls of the religious scripts is a form of art. Uh, Greek, the Greek mythologies, you see the, the stories, they also speak of heaven, the uh, hell, uh, those gods, every god has a certain uh, way of looking, has a certain way of behavior. All of those actually are a form of art without art and creativity in general we won't be able to imagine how heaven is how hell is is how, how those greek gods were how in modern let's say modern uh, religions today like islam uh, christianity uh, judaism they also have art inside of them Look at they are the, the religious scripts are called songs, Song of Solomon, the song, 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 song. The, 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 there is poetry inside their books. Poetry 
is actually a form of art, a form of expression of art. So you ask me, so why art? Why religions are using art to express not numbers? Not They do use numbers, but the stress is on the art though. Because art gives you the ability to imagine what reality cannot give you. Reality can show you a tree, but reality cannot show you the tree in, in heaven. What gives you the ability to imagine the tree in heaven is imagination, creativity, art. So an artist might draw a tree and say, this is how I imagine the tree in heaven. Uh, in the religious books, there is description of heaven. There is description of many, many different things. Uh, in, in a very artistic way, poetic, um, uh, drawings. There, there's many, many forms of art in religion. Um, if you go to um, religious places, mosques, churches, uh, synagogues, they have all of this architecture, uh, artistical architecture going on. Like uh, if you go uh, to a mosque, for example, there's this dome on the top, the dome representation of the sky. But look what art enabled human to, to do, to form a concept of, a, of heaven, the sky, in, in uh, a materialistic way. So in the book, I also speak about how art is so important in the expression of the religion. Unlike what other people say, that religion does not like art. Okay, so that's, that's kind of one of the, that's important to your book because in a lot of other books, they talk about how art doesn't associate to religion. But in exactly. your book, with your philosophy, it's the idea that religion and art can exist art, together. Art. Exactly. They, are, they need to be, they need to coincide together. One alone. You know what enters your heart in the religion is the art of the religion. Jesus, for example, Prophet Jesus and all of the prophets, they did a miracle, let's say. Some walked on the water, some uh, uh, split the sea. You need to imagine this artist artistically in your head. But the, the, what, what really affects us more in walking on the water, more in, than splitting the sea, is the art the words that were given and entered our hearts. You know? Yeah, because the, the words is what gives you the ability to even visualize what it is that this, the, what happened or whatever exactly. it is. Exactly, and, and in the Bible it's mentioned um, in one of the verses uh, and uh, at the start there was uh, the word and the word was God. So this is the word. The word plays a huge role. The word forms the poetry, forms the civilization. And then, uh, and the word was God. And then in the Quran, for example, it says, um, God is the light of the word. As a word, not the word, as, as the whole word. So God is the word, and God is the light of the word. So the word of light is God. Okay. Yeah, I got you. Um, my question is regarding your book, like what's your intent behind writing it and what's your intent behind distributing it? Because obviously you could have written a book and then just never shared it with anybody. But like what what's the purpose behind you writing a book and then wanting to make it available to for other people to read? Like what's what's your purpose behind that? Art. <laughs> art yeah so to inspire people it's an expression of art okay it is it has poetry inside of it and uh it has a lot of imagination 
a lot of concepts, a lot of um, philosophies, okay, and I gotcha. uh, it uh, the, the art inside of it enters the heart, and it brings you into uh, different ways of uh, thinking. You know, into, it gives you more um, doors you can enter. It will be more to to widen your uh, uh, the ability of your thoughts to widen into a certain limit. Oh, you'll be like, I've never thought about this that way. There is a different perspective of looking at it positively, you know? Yeah. So while you're reading that book, you might say, um, I've had a to totally different perspective. And that perspective actually was negative but now that thing makes sense what i'm reading now that like now art and religion for example you're, you're like oh yeah art and religion has many correlations so why religion hates art why artists hate religion so you know what i mean yeah. so there's many different um ways that you'll be like, yeah, why well, I didn't think about this before. So it's like a wake up about something. It's like a wake up uh, words about something, you know? Okay. So it seems like, like the way I'm picking this up, it's almost like your perspectives or your art, your expression, the way that, you know, you kind of put together this philosophy and wrote it down. I feel like I would want to get your book because I think it would give me a perspective that would probably give me a peace of mind to see it in a new way, like you said, but then like give me a sense of clarity. And I feel like ultimately it comes to finding a peace of mind. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Like just finding peace in the idea that like, oh, like it's much bigger. Maybe it's like, yeah, it's like, like maybe that's one way of seeing it, but there's also this way of seeing it. Exactly. And with that yeah. kind of bigger image, and especially when you put it in like a poetic way, which isn't so direct, it's more a little bit vague. It kind of allows you to explore. I feel like it kind of allows you to explore it yourself. Exactly. And it's called the riddle of life for a reason. Because while reading that book, there's riddles. You will read riddles inside that book. Riddles of life. And I don't want to spoil the book, but you'll just enjoy <laughs> reading it. You'll just enjoy okay. reading it. Cause I feel like right now you're, you're kind of, you're definitely holding back a little bit, but I know that you probably, <laughs> you probably don't want to give out too much. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So, um, as of a summary, as of a summary, uh, yeah, this book actually will give you, uh, new perspectives of thinking. It will enable you to um, delve into many new uh, words and realities because I would summarize the book by the word balance. There's a word. Because you'll be like, you're stuck in the middle of something, but it doesn't make sense to, not, to, not, uh, to reject what he's saying because he makes sense. But your, per, your own perspective might reject what I'm saying. But I also make sense. You know? Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. So it's like, a riddle, it is literally a riddle where, where you, you are in a place where, and, and the, the good thing about it, that you can finish it in one day, you can read it, the whole thing, in one day. And everything in, is written in just sentences. So you're reading just sentences. And like in every, at the end of every chapter, I end up with a poem, with a poetry about that chapter, about that, um, that idea I was talking about. Mm, okay. Dude, that's a pretty cool setup. And I feel like that's nice for a lot of people, especially like myself, because sometimes I don't really like to read books that are just so like filled to the rim. Yeah. You know, like I just like to like digest a little bit and then especially if it, if it's something pretty straightforward and like you said some of the sentences are like could be very few amount of words yeah but just very direct and powerful like i know for sure for me that's definitely like my kind of style 
Cause I'm not, like I said, I mean, sometimes I'll get into it where I'll read a book that's very technical, but yeah. like I can only consume a little bit and then I have to take a break. Cause like my mind's, yeah. my mind's just going to wander <laughs> somewhere else, you know? Yeah. The thing is, it is small book. You can read it anytime, anywhere. You can hold it with you. But the thing is, once you read it, you might keep reading it for the rest of your life, repeating it. Yes, it's small, but it's not just the, those books that, that you just keep them on the shelf and that's it. Those books are like those types of books where you might read them for the rest of your life. You're, you might be sitting and then you, you'll say, oh, I read that book before. It has some deep knowledge. Let me grab it again and remember some stories I read inside that book, you know? Yeah, so, I get you. Yes, you can finish it in one day, but you might not able to grasp it in one day. You'll need some sentences. You need to repeat them more than once. You might, you might not get it in one day. You might need to read it again and again and again. Till something happens in your life and boom. Oh, I now understand what that dude was saying at that <laughs> chapter, at the, in that verse. So, you know what I mean? See, and it, it makes sense that you're a musician. Because exactly. that's usually how music works, especially yeah. when you have a song that has lyrics. And like, I like like rap music. So like when you listen to rap music, there's a lot of verses and like, depending on the song, there could be a lot of words. Yes. And it's just like that. Like a lot of artists say that like, yo, like you listen to a song once, you're, there's no way you're going to pick up everything. Like maybe yeah. you get the general gist and you get the idea and you get the feeling, but there's a level of, I think it's depth, right? Like yes. your book's not that big. It's not that many pages. But it's like maybe the book, like in terms of like how many words and shit, it's like this big. But yeah. in terms of like how deep it is, it's like this deep. Exactly. So that's why I feel like that's a cool book. And it's, it's very representative of somebody who's a musician, somebody who's, who is an artist. 